Today we're going to apply what we learned yesterday about valence electrons to the reactivity of elements on the periodic table. Sometimes this is known as the octet rule, and sometimes you'll see it called the rule of eight. Let's just warm up first with some of the periodic trends that we've learned in the past. First uh, atomic trend we've learned about is atomic radius. It stated that as I move from left to right across the periodic table, the atomic radius or the size of the atom is going to decrease. Let's take a look at group period 14 for an example. So as we start, the element size is pretty large. And as we move across, we get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. This happens in each period, which makes it a periodic trend. Second trend we've learned about is the metallic trend. It states as I move from left to right across the period, the elements go from metal to metalloid to non-metal. You can simply think of this as, as I move from left to right across a period, I become less metallic. The elements become less metallic. So in group four, period four, we are metals, then they go to metalloids, and then non-metals. Same thing happens in period five. Metals, metalloids, metalloids, non-metals. It's becoming less metallic as I move to the right. The final one we learned about yesterday was valence electrons. This stated as I move from left to right across the period, the number of valence electrons increases from one to eight. So if I start over here, so if I start over in group one, I have one valence electron, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it repeats. And you'll note that this is excluding the transition metals. So none of these transition metals follow that periodic trend. So today we're going to be talking about this term chemical reactivity. And reactivity refers to how likely or how vigorously an atom will react with another substance. Now we're going to be taking a few notes today. So you're going to want out a fresh piece of paper. And at the top you're going to want to write down the title the octet rule and chemical activity. Our first note says, for most elements, the atom is reactive unless it has a complete set of valence electrons. So let's just talk about some of these terms. Reactive means the ability of an atom or molecule to undergo chemical reaction with another atom, molecule, or compound. You probably knew that. You probably don't need to write that down. Let's review valence electrons. Remember, these are the electrons in the outermost energy level, or the outermost shell. So, even though this element has five total electrons, if I would count the valence electrons, it has three. This element has lots of electrons, but it only has five valence electrons. Same thing, lots of electrons, but only four valence electrons the electrons in the outermost shell. All right, so what does it mean by a complete set of valence electrons? Well, let's write this note. Outermost energy level is complete with eight valence electrons. And we like to state that eight is great. Now, on the periodic table, naturally occurring elements that have eight valence electrons are found group 18. So for example, things like neon and argon and krypton all have eight valence electrons. So none of them are reactive. Now there's a second way you can be complete. The second way you can be complete is if K is the outermost energy level. And if this happens, you only need two valence electrons. And we like to say two will do. Now, naturally occurring, only helium is considered to have a complete set in this situation. And you might say, well, Mr. Rito, what about all of these elements found in group two? None of these elements naturally have only the K shell. They have multiple shells. In order to follow this, the K shell has to be the outermost. Helium has only one energy level, and that's the K shell and it has two valence electrons, and therefore it's complete. 
All right, so if they don't have a complete ener outer energy level, what do they do? Well, elements will combine and react in order to have a complete outer shell. Let's take a look at some examples. So here I have three elements. I have fluorine with seven valence electrons, oxygen with six valence electrons, and fluorine with seven valence electrons. None of them have a complete outer shell. All of them want to react with each other. So when they react, we create a compound that looks like this. Now what's going on here is they're actually sharing some of these valence electrons. And when they do that, Watch what happens with their outer energy levels. Fluorine now has eight. Oxygen now has eight. Fluorine now has eight. All of them have a complete energy, outer energy level now. And as this compound form, they're unreactive because eight is great. Here's another example. Hydrogen with one oxygen with six. Again, they don't have a complete shell, so right now they're pretty reactive. They go through a chemical reaction, they combine with each other and form a compound. In this compound, the oxygen has eight valence electrons, and as we just discussed, eight is great. So it's now unreactive. It's now pretty happy. <clears throat> what about the hydrogens? Hydrogen has only a K shell. So hydrogen is complete set with two, complete set with two. When K shell is your only energy level, two will do. Finally, the closer an element is to having a complete set of valence electrons, the more reactive it is. So we discussed before that group 18 is unreactive. 17 is very, very close to being, to having a complete set. And because it's very close to having a complete set of valence electrons, it is very reactive. All of these elements are extremely reactive. And we're gonna show it with a large bar here, very reactive. 16 must gain two. And because it has to gain two, it's still pretty reactive, but less reactive than that of 17. 15 has to gain three. Well, that's pretty tough to gain three valence electrons, so it's a little less reactive. 14 has to gain four, a little less reactive. And you might think to yourself, oh, well then one, two, and three probably follow this pattern. Less reactive, less reactive, less reactive. That's false. Here's why. If I take a look at boron, boron has three valence electrons and you would say to yourself, it has to gain five. Well, that's true. But boron can also do something else. It could lose three. And it's actually not that hard to lose three valence electrons. When it loses three, that shell disappears. It's left with just the K shell and two will do. It now has a complete set. So you'll see that 13 is actually more reactive than group 14. Check out beryllium. Beryllium has two. It's very easy to get two, rid of two valence electrons. They leave, the shell disappears, two will do. It has a complete set. So you'll see that everything in group two is more reactive than 13. And the same idea with lithium. Lithium's in group one, it has one valence electron. It's easy to lose that one valence electron. Two will do. You'll find that group one is extremely reactive. Now, let's get out your periodic table. And we're going to actually write down this trend on your periodic table. So here's how we want you to write it. As I move from left to right across a period, your chemical activity decreases. So that means beryllium is less reactive than lithium. Boron is less reactive than beryllium. And carbon is less reactive than boron. As I move from 14 to 17, 
the chemical activity increases. Nitrogen is more reactive than carbon, oxygen is more reactive than nitrogen, and fluorine is more reactive than oxygen. Make special note, group 18 is non-reactive because everything in group 18 has a complete set of valence electrons. One final thing I want to point out, everything in group two is more reactive than everything in the transition metals. And all of the elements in group one are more reactive than all of the elements in group two. So potassium is more reactive than everything in group two. Same idea on the right side. Group 17, chlorine, is more reactive than everything in group 16. Sulfur is more reactive than everything in group 15. So yes, this is a periodic trend. Now let's take a look at this in terms of going up and down in a group. So let's say I was just in group one. As I go down group one, the chemical activity increases. This works for group one, this works for group two. So as I go down, the chemical activity increases, which means that potassium is more reactive than sodium, calcium is more reactive than magnesium. We only use this trend when we're comparing within a group. Now on the right side, it's opposite. As I go up a group, the chemical activity increases. Again, you can write both of these on your periodic table, and you should write them both on your periodic table. Quick note, this is not a periodic trend. It's just a basic pattern that you'll find on the periodic table. Now that you've written down the notes, you've taken a few notes on your periodic table, it's time to apply what you've learned. You're going to be completing the which is more reactive worksheet in your packet and then using the periodic table worksheet in your packet. Whatever you do not finish is homework.